Tell us a bit about Gordon Moore and his curve. Well, Gordon Moore had published an article back, I believe, in when he was at Fairchild, and he had observed that every year they seemed to get better and better at making integrated circuits to the point where they could roughly double the number of parts or components on an integrated circuit uh, in a year or two. And shortly after joining Intel, he showed me his plots, his curve, and we had defined two products that Intel was going to make. One was a 64-bit um, bipolar static RAM, and the other was a 256-bit MOS static RAM. And as he put those components on his curve and on the date we expected to have them, they were actually a little more aggressive than his curve would have predicted. And I, th I think it may not be clear if why people understand them, but if I take a minute, we consider we would usually target to, let's say, yield about 10%. Now, it costs about $50 to process a wafer. Now, maybe you have 100 potential circuits on that wafer. You're running 10% yield. You got 10 good circuits. So you cut the wafer up. Costs you maybe a dollar to package them, so now they're costing about $6 each. You sell them for $10 to $20, and you make a nice profit. Now, if you said, okay, I'm going to make something simpler, only half as big. Now you got maybe 200 sites on the wafer, and you get more like 30% or more yield. So now you're running 60 to 70 good devices. In fact, it's actually better than that because you lose a certain amount around the edge of a round wafer when they're rectangular dice. But now you've got devices that are costing you maybe less than a dollar, but you're still paying a dollar to put them in a package. So in effect, packaging, if you make it too small, dominates the cost. But what happens if you double the size? Now maybe you have less than 50 die sites and your yield goes to about 1%. So now they're going to cost you maybe $100 a circuit, and it would be cheaper for the customer to buy his circuit a different, a different way. He could go, you know, this is a 1969 Allied catalog, he could go and buy smaller scale integrated circuits and make whatever he wants using that rather than your Isaac. So that's why Moore's Law was so important. It predicted where you should be at a certain point in time if you want to optimize the cost benefit of an integrated circuit. And we still hear about that today. So they, Intel started out in bipolar and switched to MOS. Do you, can you tell us a little bit about the 1102, the Honeywell device, and, the, and eventually the 1103 that became so big? Well, actually, Intel started out right from the beginning to make two products, another, and two different processes. Now, the technique that was used for bipolar logic uh, was a technique called gold doping. Mm -hmm. In other words, the wafer would be treated with a layer of gold, and it actually almost destroyed it some of the silicon properties, but it prevented one of the delay uh, phenomena that tended to make the circuits very slow. A way around that was called the Schottky bipolar process. The Schottky is a special type of diode that was made with an aluminum silicon contact, and it was put in a certain place to keep the transistor from going into this mode where it would build up charge. So it was a new process, and Intel decided to develop it. The other thing, up until then, most MOS was done with what's called metal gate, and the silicon gate was a new MOS process uh, that had been developed in a number of places. There was work going on it at Philco Ford. There was work going on it uh, at Hughes, and there was work going on at Fairchild. And they brought the basic ideas from Fairchild, uh, you know, Andy Grove, Bob Noyce, Gordon Moore, but there was still quite a bit of work that was done at Intel to get it to actually work. But it was being pretty well developed by early 1969. In fact, at my point, the company was formed somewhere around July of 68. We actually took possession of the building where Intel started 
which was occupied by Union Carbide Semiconductor, mm -hmm. and we took possession as of September of 1968. We had one meeting, I believe, in August, where we were only allowed to use the foyer of the building. We couldn't go inside. <laughs> but it was an advantage to have the utilities, the structure, the already of a semiconductor company, not have to start from scratch. Yes. In fact, we only got possession of half the building, and the other half of the building had some old equipment that had been left by Union Carbide. So in the early days, Jimmy Intel bought all this brand new, beautiful looking equipment, all stainless steel and had Intel blue <coughs> painting on it. And we would take a potential customer around and show them all our new equipment. Then we'd take them back into the Union Carbide area and show them this old equipment and say, that's how the rest of the industry works. <laughs> <laughs>